Hello, and welcome to Regrets I've Had a Few. I'm Paul Hunter, Artistic Director of Told by an Idiot, and this is a podcast where I talk to friends and colleagues delving into what made them the person they are today. Hello, and welcome. My guest this month is a director who has been at the heart of British theatre for the past three decades. He has been a champion of new writing and a robust interpreter of the classics, from Edward Bond to Shakespeare. He was artistic director of the Lig Theatre Hammersmith for 10 years, where acclaimed productions included Bugsy Malone and the Olivier Award-winning Plastic. He is currently associate artistic director of Shakespeare's Globe and recently co-directed me and others in Charlie Josephine's Glorious Cowboys. Welcome, Sean Holmes. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Not at all. It's very nice to see you and I appreciate it. You joining us at the end of a very uh, busy day on the Much Ado About Nothing, which we might touch on uh, a bit later. Um, what I tend to start with, if you don't mind, Sean, is I take my guests back uh, to a very early memory of theatre, some seeing performance, live performance. Was was that something that was in your family? Did you go regularly or what, what, what was the score? No, so my family weren't in. It wasn't something that we did, but my memory is panto, that that is what we did. And I remember that a really early memory that has a really, has really stuck with me is we went to see panto and I wasn't sure, I couldn't tell you who it was. It was probably Dick Whittington because the scene was in a ship's cabin and it had two people from it, ain't half hot mum, Mervyn Hayes. And whoever played La Gunner Graham. Yes. And they were playing Okay. Um cricket is like a food fight, and they were playing cricket and they were hitting dough into the audience. Now, my adult director brain goes, it couldn't have been real dough. But anyway, whatever it was, I was in the front row and people were throwing something back and I threw it and it sort of caught whatever I threw in my child's memory hit. Lardy Dargar and Graham on the leg. And he turned around and looked quite cross. And I think there was a real moment where I was like, oh, they're really, this isn't telly or film. They're really there. And probably that's where a directing career was born, where I've been throwing things at actors ever since. Maybe, I don't know if you're going to psychoanalyze it. <laughs> we won't go into that. I'll get enough <laughs> of that home. Um, but um, it's interesting that, that it was... But it obviously, I think we're of a similar generation. If mm. if the two two of the stars of Ain't Half Hot Mom were were in Panto, it was uh, sometime, I suppose, the seventies. Yeah. So I was born sixty nine. Um, so it would have been yeah, I would have been about seven or eight, I think. So what's that mid sixties, mid seven, mid seventies? Yeah. And do you see it in London or anywhere? No, because I grew up just outside. So I grew up in. Egham and then Adelston, which is Surrey, not this, not so much the leafy part. Um, and then um, I think it was either Woking or Reading. I remember getting on a coach to go to Reading as a sort of bus trip to see the Panto. So I've got sort of various meetings merged, but one of those places, Woking or Reading or maybe Guildford. So no uh, showbiz or performance or theatre in the family background anywhere? No, none at all, really, none at all. I, I, I got into um, I got into private school when I was 11. My dad was a builder and he was making a bit of money. And uh, I did the 11 plus for a school that had until recently been the grammar school and we got and I got in. And I sort of hated it for the first half and wanted to leave. My parents wouldn't let me. And then um, we had a really great drama teacher, Mr. Franz Koviak, and we were the sort of... <laughs> We weren't a very academic year, but we weirdly got really into drama, or maybe not so weirdly, and did drama. Oh, it was O level in those days. And then he rather brilliantly said, if you get your parents to write in, um, we might be able to do theatre studies A level, sixth form, which we did. And more excitingly, um, you you had it had to be a mixed group. It couldn't be one gender. I don't know why that was the rules. So we it was the first time we collaborated academically with the girls' school next door. So we also had, um, so we also did theatre studies A level with um, 
the young women from next door, which was exciting and good. Yeah. I'm sure it, I'm sure it was. And I'm assuming, Sean, at that stage, you were very much treading the boards. You were acting, I'm assuming. Well, I was a bit, but what was weird is when I look back on it, it, we had, it was quite interesting that when you think about it compared to A-levels now, you know, we had to devise, there was very little teaching in the actual exam because we had to devise our own um, piece. And, and we, di we did that, uh, a sort of collage of sketches and ideas about, I mean, it's probably like terrible, but about America called A Beautiful Mistake taken from an Elvis Costello um, album. And, but I think I sort of was sort of the director without necessary directing, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with from, you know, a, a company that's not so hierarchical, but somebody ends up directing. It was it sort of felt like that thing where somebody needed to be the outside eye as well as in it. So I never really, I did do some acting then when I went to university and stuff and maybe just after, but it was never, I, yeah, it wasn't the thing that most excited me. Theatre excited me more than acting, I think. It, often when I talk to friends and pals on this podcast thing, people identify a teacher, whether it's, a, if in my case, it was an English teacher, and clearly this drop mm. teacher had some influence there. And and was that teacher also kind of, I mean, when you went, you say you went on to university, did you, did you do drama or did you do a different subject? No, I did. I did English at York University, um, and but you know you got a lot of time at that time, and also York had uh, a brilliant space. I think it still does called the Drama Bar, which was does, does what it said on the tin. It was a black box space that was an old barn, but it had a kind of magic. So Simon Stevens talks about it. He, the writer, went a couple of years after me and talks about it. And there's other people, you know ex-alumni of York who talk about that space and so that was a really that was one of the things I most like about York was making shows in that space. You mentioned obviously uh, yourself and Simon Stevens who were some of the other alumni? Well it, there's, there wasn't many people at York in those in those days I think there's probably more after but it, it was one of the funny things about that university you know because again this was the 80s it was only about 20 years old so I think it was like Jack Straw Maybe somebody's like Harvey Proctor or something. I can't remember really. Um, <laughs> but it was quite nice. That was one of the nice things about it, that you were not in this kind of hallowed halls of the Cambridge or Oxford Drama Society, which I'm sure has its own strengths. But um, it, but it was like just mucking about in a barn. Nobody didn't really seem to lead to anything, which is probably the best way to lead to something. I think that's true. Yeah. That is true. And, yeah. um and did you take shows up to Edinburgh? Was that something that you... No, I did a bit later, just after I left university. So uh, I'll try and do this story quickly. No, no, you don't. So there's a writer now, a writer, playwright and film writer, television writer called Vincent O'Connell, who's a friend of mine. But we met at York because he was 10 years... He'd left York 10 years before and had moved back up there to write. And we a small place and we bumped into each other and called free mobiles you just used to bump into people in a pub and have a drink and a chat and we got on um really well and the week before i left university we happened to bump into each other in the urinal at the john ball which they've knocked down now sadly um and i gave him my number like he did in those days never necessarily thought i would hear from him as much as i liked him but he called me that summer saying oh my friend in bristol is at bristol university he's directing a show of mine for um Edinburgh and an act uh, has dropped out uh, your girlfriend um I've seen her in a couple of shows would she be up for doing it so my girlfriend in the, at the time was somebody called Mary Louise and she got on a train and went down to Bristol to meet the uh, the woman who was directing the show who she didn't know and maybe had one short phone conversation with and then I don't know what was going on with that show but a couple of, but about a week later the two men in the show dropped out and they phoned me and my friend Giles and we got in my Ford Fiesta and drove down to um, Bristol. And the director was Sarah Cape, who uh -huh. was in, uh, who was about to start her last year at, um, at Bristol. And uh, we, we, they scrapped that play and Vince had a series of short plays, um, short sort of one page scenes or mini plays. Um, and they d we decided to do those and we took those to Edinburgh and it was called Dream Screens and Silences and it was directed by Sarah 
and Vince wrote them. And also there were two monologues by Sarah, which were the second half. But the sort of extraordinary thing about the experience was Vince would start the show by asking the audience for a title, would go off into the cafe, write, I'd be on a typewriter and then have to print it off. I don't know how you did it pre laptop, write the play, bring it back in. And at the start of the interval, we would sort of read it and act it live for the audience. And you just get it and go for it. And then we would, if we liked it, which we often did because he started to write for us because we were all living in a flat together. We would then replace one of the existing short plays with one of the new ones. So by the end of the run, it was significantly different. And it was a sort of extraordinary experience, really. And um, yeah, and Sarah's sort of brilliant theatre brain and Vince too. And it was also, uh, you know, as part of the sort of learning, uh, just to be immersed in in two such great brains and people who took it so seriously, but were also a real laugh as well. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It's a really memorable. Yeah, that's an amazing story and an amazing con you know connections being made there. And it's interesting you say about having a laugh. I think I mentioned this to you maybe in the dirty ducking strap of one night or something. But I didn't know Sarah Kane very well. But my memory of her is having a real laugh in Bucharest when she was out mm. with the Royal Court. We were there with Tom and Idiot. She saw our show. We had a really great laugh all night. Mm. To about three in the morning and I, I, I when I hear her name and I think of her I, laughter is something I, yeah for me was was a thing but and did you obviously you then stayed in touch with her and you uh, later you collaborated again or it, I, I didn't I just did she she and Vince and uh, really good friends and and Mary Louise who were my girlfriend at the time as well was super really good friends with Sarah and with Vince and um we um and we did a couple of little things I think but part of Brighton Festival um it's just really funny trying to remember I think probably not long after that uh, and yes and Sarah was a friend really and I saw uh, you know I went to see like you would went to see your friends play I went to see the second preview of Blasted wow. um which was an interesting experience um because it, what everyone slightly forgets about that is it was quite, though it was at Royal Court, it was sort of quite fringy because it was the new writing festival. It was a three-week run, sort of deliberately cheap set. You know, it was a really exciting idea. Yeah. And I remember my friend being, my friend who's always late, was always late. And we just got in at the time and he squeezed in on the bench seats they had then. And I knew it was nearly two hours, no interval. I was thinking, oh, you know, God, this is quite long. And then it started. And when we came out, and this is the sort of thing that hardens into anecdote, but it's genuinely true. He said, what What do you think? And I said, I don't know, but I feel like we've just seen something really important. And it did genuinely feel like that. And that's why it was such a sort of shock and so stupid, the sort of insane and hysterical critical response to the production, which didn't really, you know, the interesting thing was there was no, I didn't have a clue or an inkling that that would happen. Yeah. Though it was obviously a shocking and disturbing and provocative play it was also sort of profound and moving and moral um and so it was just really weird uh, you know a, a sort of such a huge event i think for sarah um sort of deeply unfair and weird i think yeah no it's strange and to be there as you say to see it right at the very beginning is is, is quite an it's quite an event in itself i suppose mm -hmm. so what about your kind of because i i People always ask me about, oh, you know, about you know, as you carry on on your journey in theatre or whatever. And I, I never like the word career or something like that. It always sounds a bit too formal. But um, how, how, when did it become something where you thought, I want to try and make a living from this? I, or how did you make that transition from, from a slightly more student-y stuff going on to going, I, I, was it assisting or how, how did you take? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I, I really agree with you. I think the thing is that, especially when you're starting out, it can feel like there's these people with careers. Yeah. Whereas I think career is, career is, especially in theatre and what we do is sort of accident often. Um, so I I did, didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I sort of wanted to be a director. I had no clue how to go about it. And I did a MA at King's College London and RADA called Text and Performance Studies. I think it was like the second year of that course. And it was a bit of a mishmash of things. But what was great is you just spent a year um, with 20 like-minded people who were really into theatre and sort of brilliantly, we'd all sit in the, go and see things and say how we would have done it better. You know, yeah. that's really funny to think about now, you know, 
how we would have directed Shakespeare on the Barbican stage better. <laughs> um, you know, anyway, um, but that's part of it, isn't it? To 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 have to be in opposition. Um, and then the thing that was most lucky, the Orange Tree had a resident, a trainee director post for a year, and um, I and there were two of us, and I applied for that, and I got one of the posts. And what's interesting is a lot of people who came, Rachel Kavanagh, Dominic Hill, James Brining, James Brining, sorry, for education at the Orange Tree, Tim Sheeder. So there was like around that, you know, we're of a similar generation, some are slightly younger. Um, and it was interesting because Sam just, it was a sort of really interesting time to be at the Orange Tree, to assist, but regularly. And I used to sort of pester Sam because they had the new space, but they still had the old space above the pub. And I sort of would pull things off for 50 quid. And, you know, I look back on it now and I think God, you know, thank goodness for Sam letting me do that. And I did some sort of terrible stuff and some stuff I was sort of proud of. But you were making stuff in a way which I think is so hard now with with not a lot of um, jeopardy because it's really hard. What you need is a chance to make mistakes. And it's particularly hard as a director because there's, you know, it's really obvious, but you sort of need actors and a play and a rehearsal space in the theatre and maybe some lights and sound. You know, it, it quite quickly builds and it's quite hard to get that. So so that was that was my um, journey for a bit. Yeah, and, and but it was difficult financially because you didn't get paid very much. You did some shifts on... Um, you did some shifts on box office and front of house. Apprenticeship. Um, and also, you know, you could sign on a bit in those days. Yes. And housing benefit and all that stuff that just seems, you know, a world away now. No, no I also think, I, you know, when I talk to younger actors and some of the guys in Cowboys and stuff, and uh, I don't know how young directors and performers manage, manage to live in London. Never mind, mate, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a very different, it was a very different landscape then in the early 90s, wasn't it? You know, rents were much cheaper, much, much more available. Um, yeah, so it's really difficult for people now. And we were lucky, definitely, that we, um, that we had that bit more freedom. Yeah, um, true. And a bit more support in, in some way. Yeah. Ways. Yeah. So I, I'm going to move forward a bit now because I, I obviously, I want to touch on many things and I want to, talk about your brilliant time at the lyric but who were the directors that were kind of influencing you as, as a younger director who were you going i've got to see their show when they do a show i've got to be there to see what they do so i think definitely i would say one of the people who i most admire was katie mitchell when she was at the rsc and then moved on from there but she was at the rsc as a director when i was an assistant she did a production of phoenician women and I just, the sort of purity and rigour of her work really spoke to me. Um, again, because I was a bit, un, uh, uh, what's the word? Because I didn't come through a theatrical background. And then because I was in York, where there wasn't a lot of theatres to see, you, you know, I, I didn't feel as literate in theatre. I, I think, interestingly, rather than directors, it was places. It was the Bush under Dominic, even though I didn't know Dominic. Um, you know, it, it was it was sort of going to the Bush and seeing Making Noise Quietly or uh, the Kreutz plays that stuck with me. It was um, the, I think, the Royal Court under Daldry. Obviously, Sarah, we mentioned, but, you know, when they came into town as well, when the theatre was being redeveloped, um, I, I was sort of, I've always been quite omnivorous, if you see what I mean, rather than having a particular taste. So I think it was more like theatres and flavours than particular directors, um, I would I would say. It's interesting you talk about theatres because obviously you ended up running a brilliant theatre and you did it really brilliantly as well. And Thank you. It's interesting for me because obviously I feel like we've become mates more recently, even though we've kind of known each other for a long time. And you mm. mentioned Dancing Counters, us bumping each other. We mm. bumped into each other uh, in the wonderful Pineapple Pub and you get chatting and stuff. And I realised we didn't really, I cared to see lots of things there, but we didn't work together there. And mm. I think, I mean, that sense, was it always in your kind of thinking, I'd love to have a go at running a building? Or, or was it something that you kind of in that moment went, you know, what, I'm going to go for this? What did... 
Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think it probably wasn't. So I, I'd been, um, I had been um, associate at Oxford Stage Company with Dominic Drongall that's now headlong and really supported by Dominic and given lots of opportunities. Um, and then when when Dominic left, I went for I went for the artistic director of Oxford Stage Company, but I can really look back on it and go, I understand why they didn't give it to me because I think A, it's very hard if you've been part of a regime. It is a hard thing to to enthuse about a new vision without criticizing the old one and so on. And also I just don't, you know, Rupert got it and he was in a better place to get it than me at that time, definitely. Because I think when you apply for jobs, that it's like a matchmaking. You discover whether you're ready for it or not. And then, but I was sort of starting to circle around it. And then actually Dominic phoned me when um, the lyric became a possibility and said I should go for it. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure. And I thought about it. And then it was really funny. Just before the deadline, I'd gone out with a friend, a designer, that's actually called Wills, and we were working on a show. And we'd ended up having quite a lot to drink and stuff. And he said, oh, you should do it, you should do it. And I got back and I sort of wrote the act of application drunk that night. And when I read it the next day, it was actually quite good because I think it had been building and building and kind of splurged out. And as I went through the process for the artistic director of the lyric, which was, I think, at least two, if not two and a half meetings or three, what was interesting is I felt more and more clear and more and more articulated a vision of what I wanted and more and more like committed to wanting to run it and one of the reasons was and it's the first thing i wrote in that application is the lyric was always the place in london that i sort of most enjoyed as an audience member because there was something about you saw rubbish <laughs> and you saw great stuff and you never quite know what you're going to see it's a beautiful theater it's some sort of weird energy because it's in hammersmith and it's a concrete box with a 19th century theater inside it and i think it it met me and i met it it, and it was the right time. And also what's really important to say is the team around it, obviously Jessica Hepburn, who'd already been in place as executive director, and we we ran that place together. And it was an arranged marriage, but sometimes they work. Um, and um, it, then we had a really young team that we um, that, that sort of got promoted as we went along. And it felt that, you know, we got loads of things wrong or something, but there was something about the spirit of that place that I'm really proud of. And the fact that lots of us are still really close from that time. There's a really extended family that's still connected in lots of ways. And also oh, clearly our work with young people and how that ran like us at the right for a stick of rock through the building and everyone kind of got that. And the fact that we could be local, London wide, national, international, yeah. you know, that was the thing at its best. And I think an example would be, I think we were probably the only theatre in the world where you could program Blasted in Blasted followed by Cinderella and they both feel absolutely the right choice, both speaking to our audience in different ways and probably different audiences and, and actually the people in the theatre being equally proud of both. Um, and, and, and there's something in that that I'm... Um, that, 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 that is the thing I really like about that and is... Um, you know, made the lyric its sort of weird, special thing. I think you sum that up very well. You capture that spirit of the building and what the lyric is really well. And not, obviously, in your time, but in lots of periods. I'm yeah. going to see a lot of work when Neil was there, Neil Bartlett. And I think it always managed to combine the sacred and the profane in that in that wonderful, you know, as you say, interior. And and I, I totally agree what you mean about a team. I was only there recently to see Jessica's book launch and mm. saw a lot of old faces, you know, and Seamus, the head of production, and all these people have been there for years. And and, uh, and also that amazing rebuild or whatever you did for mm. the young company and all that. Mm. So, no, it's a real legacy, that. And uh, uh, my, my next question is, do you think you're done with running a building or would you do it again? Uh, it's a good question. So I've had one or two conversations and in one case a bit further than a conversation. Um, uh, <laughs> I really like it. I like, I, look, I suppose one answer is I'm really lucky. I'm Associate Artistic Director of the Globe. I, I get to support Michelle and her brilliant vision uh, and support loads of work that we do in this place. And um, it's a really rewarding creative job. And I can also help to lead artistically through directing plays. And so I'm really, really lucky with that. Um, 
And also that obviously gives me elements of leadership without having to lead, 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 like Michelle does. Um, but also it is something I enjoy, um, as you'll know from, you know, from when we did Cowboys together. And, you know, there's this, uh, what I hope and what Charlie and I hope brought is brought your best self to the room. And it's the same if I was running an organisation. I think it's harder now. It felt hard when I ran the lyric, but compared, to, but the, just the financial reality now is so much harder. I think there's a post-COVID aftershock still, which is financial, but also around, yeah, people are more, and this is not a criticism, but people are, you know, all of us are more fragile yeah, or more vulnerable or whatever the word is. So it's just a more, di and the world is more divided, divisive, and volatile yeah. quick to anger volatile and all those things so it, it is hard but i do so what are they i'm not ruling out the possibility <laughs> yeah yeah or whatever but there's no but at the same time i also think um you know what i kind of enjoy as well is i think i really enjoyed working with people from generations above me and learning from them as an assistant director or as a director working with older writers or whatever that might be and I think there's also a weird thing as I'm about to hit 55, where you can also really enjoy collaborating with those younger than you. So you saw it work when, you know, at first hand with me and Charlie working and learning from each other. Yeah. And also I've done it with Holly Race Rowan when we did Metamorphosis here, um, or Alinka Radulian when we did Henry VI and Richard III together here before the pandemic. And it's something I really, um, I really enjoy that shared leadership and shared collaboration. And as I say, that comes across really clearly, Sean. And I think as we come towards the end of this lovely chat, uh, I wanted to touch on that one thing observation when you were chatting then is you, you did sound a bit like a football manager that's been linked to a job in Juventus and you're going, I won't rule myself out. Of I did that deliberately because I knew you'd get the reference actually. It was in exactly, my head. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and then maybe being at the Globe, uh, and as you say, supporting um, uh, the vision, Michelle's vision, made me feel that you were maybe a bit like the Peter Taylor of, of British theatre in the sense that many people thought he was the brains behind the club. But anyway, I'll stop my football analogies. And what I did want to say is how brilliant it was to see you collaborate as a director. And it's you, you wear it very lightly and you talk about it in a way quite lightly. But I can't think of any, well, I can't think of any other directors that openly collaborate with other directors in the room. And you, I experienced it only once, but, and of course, actors are, are, are cynical. So they go, what was that like? Mm. What was it like with Sean and Charlie together? And I go, actually it was great. And they, they don't believe you initially. No, no, come on. What was it like? What was it? I said, it was really good. Mm. And it was really good because obviously you were very, very generous towards each other and to the room. And I suppose my question is, well, it's the question is more an observation, I suppose. It feels really interesting that, as you say, as a, as a director who's maybe, you know, gone f a bit further down the line to not only support younger directors, but but work with them together on something. It, it, I just wanted to say, I, I think it's great. It's really good. Yeah, thank you. And I think you've got to be careful that you don't, you know, it's really easy. Charlie put it brilliantly. Uh, they said, it's really tiring to keep learning. Yeah. And I think you meet lots of people who get to our generation and they are still curious because curiosity isn't tiring, but to properly learn <laughs> is, is tiring. And you've learned a lot by the time you get to our age, hopefully. And so you can, the danger is you feel, you know it. And the thing is, it's good, but experience is, you know, part of the thing in that room is it's just a thing. It doesn't mean the show is going to be brilliant, but probably the show is going to be all right because I've got a track record of doing shows that are all right. Yeah. So there's a sort of, gives you a bit more room for manoeuvre. And also clearly Charlie's written a smashing play and is great human and artist. And there's lots of people in that room also had a connection with Charlie. So that chemo it wasn't an accident, the chemical combination of everyone in that room, because that's also important to think about as, as, as you know. But the thing about it is it also does something interesting, which is, I think what's happened increasingly is act, the actor as a creative, the actor who has to take responsibility for, for bits of their job has been sort of slightly compressed by this idea. But, and I think directing can feel a bit like control at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and there's lots of actors, there's lots of directors that make brilliant shows who do that, but I can't do that. I'm not interested in your intention or objective of every single line. I can do it. I'm interested in it if it doesn't seem to be there. But more and more, I think it's about the actor providing that and the actor driving the room with their ideas and we can react to that. So I'm always trying to build a frame within which people can be free with clarity. And then, you know, you shape it as you go together and trying the, the, the baseline is we're there to try and have a good time because that's why we all did it in the first place, which is important. Uh, I think that's brilliant. And what's great, Sean, is how well you articulate that. I think there'll be a lot of younger directors in particular would be interested to hear you talk quite specifically about your process in the second one. Well, we, we, we bled into it a little bit, but it's interesting mm. to hear that. Um, it's been brilliant chatting, uh, but in, uh, there's beer to be drunk and snooker to be played in my case. And, um, <laughs> and I don't know why you're <laughs> But um, on that note, I always finish the same way. I ask seven rapid fire questions. You just say the first response that comes into your head. And I'll start with beer, Guinness or Pale Ale? Guinness. Chekhov or Shakespeare? Shakespeare. The Sam Wanamaker or the Globe Outdoors, whatever you call it. Ooh. That's hard. That's really hard. Um, Globe outside, which I didn't necessarily think I would say, but yes. Uh, French or Saunders? French. Uh, this is a, a, a Fulham choice, from, but from uh, probably around the time, if not slightly earlier than when you went to the pantomime. So it might be something that you'll have to confer with your dad about. Rodney Marsh or George Best? Ooh. Well, it have to be George Best, I would think. It would. It, well, I can't believe they both played for Fulham. Played oh, no. And Bobby Moore. Um, yeah. Uh, this is about your DIY skills. Carpentry or plumbing? Well, I think <laughs> carpentry, just because the, the consequences are, are probably less disastrous when I tried to do it. Well, you might want to weigh up the consequences of my final question. Yoga or Pilates? I think I'm more a yoga person. Brilliant. Sure, it's been a real pleasure. We will have that fight soon. I'll, well, I'll certainly be down to the globe to see Lovely. what you do, and uh, I look forward to that. But yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jen, as well. All the best. See you soon. Thank All you. the best. Lots of love. Bye. Dear listeners, if you've enjoyed this idiot podcast, please spread the word 